believe that being a defender requires more than building shooting skills on a range. It's also a development of the heart, mind, body, and spirit. Join us as we explore what it truly means to be a defender in your training and in your everyday life. Welcome to Defenders Live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Defenders Live. I'm your host, Laura Thorson, and it's great to be with you again on a Wednesday evening. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Tonight, I'll be airing my interview with a man from South Africa who is a Christian missionary. His name is a little tricky to pronounce so here, so it doesn't sound like what it looks like. His name is Charles Van Veek, and he is uh, the missionary who defended his church during the St. James Massacre in 1993, where um, terrorists attempted to attack the church and uh, quite a story that you'll like to hear, I'm sure. So, um, but due to the time difference in South Africa, he was not able to be on live tonight. There's an eight hour time difference. So I did a recording with him and I'll be presenting that here shortly. Um, just a few things before we start. Uh, please let me know where you're watching from in the comments. And as the interview um, goes on, feel free to comment with any thoughts or questions that you have. Um, and if you're newer watching this as a replay tonight, welcome. So we're so glad that you're here as well. Adam Winch, the founder of Defenders USA, is behind the scenes helping me tonight. I definitely need it tonight. Uh, and since Adam and Charles have a couple things in common, he may have some commentary at the end of the broadcast. So tune in for that. Not guaranteed, but I have a feeling he'll have a few things to say. Um, so let's see here. Oh, and the last thing I wanted to let you know is the best way to keep up to date on what's going on with Defenders Live is to sign up for the email list at defenders-live Dot com. Go to the bottom of the page, put in your email address if you want direct contact from me. I've noticed that in the Facebook group, there is not much reach. Whenever I put something up, um, it does not go to very many people. And there are a lot of people in that Facebook group. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss anything from me on what's going on, please sign up for that email blast at defenders-live.com. Every week, I'll send out who will be coming up um, as well as a link to the show itself. All right, so let's get into Charles von Veik, uh, his bio, and I'll introduce him and then I'll run the interview. When I start the interview, guys, if you can't hear it, please let me know. So Charles is a Christian missionary, author, and activist in Africa. His belief in his Christian duty to protect the innocent, vulnerable, and oppressed led him to single-handedly return fire in the midst of a terrorist attack, saving many lives. The story of how God led Charles to forgive and pursue reconciliation with his attackers is captured in his best-selling book called Shooting Back, The Right and Duty of Self-Defense. Now he is engaged in a new war, a battle to establish kingdom-focused covenant communities in Southern Africa. His proactive stance on educating the church and renewing minds with a biblical worldview drives him to see communities change through the gospel discipleship, and community development. So let me see if I can pull up this interview here and let's uh, watch this together. And, um, I thought I heard in a, in a video that I saw about you and they could have been misinformed, but I thought they said you were a former soldier. Is that true? Uh, yes and no. Uh, during the apartheid time in South Africa, we were forced uh, to do two years national service. And that uh, is the what is being referred to as me being a soldier. So I was in the infantry for the two years national service. It wasn't by uh, desire. It was uh, because of laws in South Africa. So yes, I had two years of training in the Defense Force. Did you grow up in South Africa or how did you make your way there? Well, Laura, my family arrived actually in the late 1600s. Uh, they arrived in, wow. in Africa. So as I say to many Americans, I might be more African than you might be American. <laughs> so we're talking <laughs> a, couple of, a couple of generations of family uh, that arrived here in Cape Town in the yeah, late 1600s already. Wow. 
And you said when you were younger that you um, you weren't involved in any kind of like you didn't go hunting or had any real experience with firearms. It wasn't until later in your life that you. Yeah, we we had pellet guns, you know, as kids and would shoot around uh, in those days. There were many fields around. Uh, Cape Town didn't have four and a half million people in it at that time. And so mm -hmm. we would have fun with pellet guns and, uh, you know, I uh, hate to admit it today, but shoot the odd birds and eat them and that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. and, then, and then on one occasion, I remember as a youngster uh, hunting rabbits on, on uh, a family member's farm, uh, again, for, for eating and for feeding uh, the dogs and that on the farm, that sort of mm -hmm. thing. But otherwise, I'm, I'm not a, a hunting person. I'm not a big gun guy. I don't... Uh, I've done many courses. Uh, I was in the military for two years. So I've done lots of uh, training courses with various people over various times, but uh, I'm certainly not uh, a person that is training others or knows a lot about guns. And mm -hmm. I, I really do carry out of necessity uh, at the end of the yeah. day yeah, with the crime rate in South Africa and the challenges we have regarding that. And what are the, what are the gun laws like there or... What is the culture and the the laws that regard firearms there? Yeah, in the year 2000, a new uh, law was uh, brought about called the Firearms Control Act. And basically that law, which was only promulgated later, but anyway, let's uh, put that aside, uh, basically is a terrible piece of machinery. Uh, it's got, uh, you literally... If you are charged with anything gun-related in South Africa, the law stipulates that you must go prove your innocence in court. So this whole idea of Western legal philosophy that you're innocent until proven guilty in a court of law goes out of the window with this, mm. with this law. Uh, all of us who had firearms previously before the new law had to re-register our firearms and reapply for the licenses we already had. So that wow. was a big challenge for us. At the time, we had about 500 gun shops in South Africa. The new laws made it so onerous that they couldn't um, physically, in the market uh, that was destroyed, carry on uh, making profits. And so about 400 gun shops closed down. So we are really limited in stock and and getting ammunition and all that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. the, the the new authorities made it very, very difficult to uh, to keep a firearm. I, I had to reapply, uh, depending on what kind of license you have, you have to reapply every five or ten years uh, for a new license. And you, it's not just, um, you know, a quick form that you fill in. You literally almost start from scratch with all the paperwork Mm -hmm. And it took me probably, I would say, about 15 hours of work. And I don't, I don't classify myself wow. as, a, as a dumb person. It's just so much paperwork to get through uh, to, to renew your license. Um, and when I did that, I think I waited over a year for the renewal process to go through um, before wow. the, my, new, my renewal actually physically ended up in my hand. And people have been complaining that they can wait anything from two months to two years for a new application. That's not a renewal. That's to get a new gun, a new one altogether. Wow. And so it becomes a big challenge uh, with people that are buying firearms. They're putting a lot of money down for it, you know, two, three thousand mm dollars -hmm. sometimes if it's a, a really nice firearm. They go through the courses, they do the practical, they get their paperwork done, go to the range, prove that they can shoot, all these things. And then the political commissars in South Africa, the Central Firearms Register, deny them a license. Wow. I've got friends. I've got friends that have been in the army for two years. They've been taught how to strip rifles and put them back together again. They can shoot properly. And uh, when they did the application, they were denied a license. That's just the way it is. It's a political game that gets played here. Then you're talking about getting lawyers in and appeal processes and all that sort of thing. So it's a bit, it's a real challenge. Uh, for us, but if you want one, you've got to work very hard. You <laughs> and you're willing to call on lawyers, and that you you can get through the the, the system. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. <sighs> huh. So then, then once you did get approved to carry a firearm, then 
was that something you did on a regular basis? Was that just part of your lifestyle or did you on this particular day just happen to carry it for whatever reason? Um, I first uh, got my first handgun, which was a, a 38 Special Revolver, when, uh, well, it was many years ago, probably, let me think, I'm trying to work it out now, probably more than 30 years ago. So in those days, the the, the old law was far easier to deal with. So oh, literally, yeah. you you just had to pay for a permit at the local post office, and you got your license in a week. So mm -hmm. that's when I first got my license. And the reason I got it was I was traveling with a friend to their farm with my little pickup vehicle and my motorbike on the back. And in the evening, in the dark, while we were traveling through the, the last village or town before we could get to the farm, we all of a sudden saw tires burning in the streets. And that was Nelson Mandela's African National Congress group. They were burning tires uh, for political action. And as we stopped the vehicle, uh, to do a U-turn, they belted us with um, bricks and rocks uh, at our vehicle and smashed the vehicle and the motorbike on the back of the vehicle. Uh, so we did a quick U-turn and drove away. And uh, I immediately that next week, so this was on the weekend, Friday night, uh, the next week I applied for my license and less than a week after that, I physically went and collected my firearm at the gun shop. So it was a very quick process and... Um, my attitude then was that if somebody threatens my life again and they're going to try and kill me or any members of my family, um, I'm going to use lethal force to defend us. Mm -hmm. And so did you say that training was a, was required to get the permit or no at that time? Not at that time, uh, okay. but I had already done my national service and, and I did struggle okay. at the time with the issue of um, should Christian men... Um, you know, on the one side, I understood that we could go to war on, on behalf of our government to protect the people of our, our, our country. Uh, we were, it was during the time of the Cold War, and the Cold War was a very hot war in Africa. It wasn't a Cold War. So we had action around us. The African National Congress, Nelson Mandela's group, and they had the finance and backing of the Chinese and the Russians, who were the, the big uh, communists of, of that time. The Chinese had murdered 100 million people since 1917, and the, the atrocities were carrying on in Africa, southern and central Africa, as, as per usual. So um, I could understand theologically the idea of taking up arms to defend and protect your people, but I really struggled with uh, carrying a firearm personally on the streets and, mm -hmm. uh, and dealing with thugs that might be a threat to ourselves. But I must admit that. Um, after the the uh, bricks and rocks being thrown at us and um, and our lives being threatened in that way, that was a big wake up call for me. And mm -hmm. then I also read an article by the former executive director of Gun Owners of America. His name was Larry Pratt, and he dealt with the issue of the theology of Christian men carrying arms to protect their families. And that really persuaded me. And I later I became friends with Larry and um, I met him. And uh, he really had a great impact on my life as from a theological perspective, being a Christian man and wanting to live out my Christian life uh, to mm -hmm. the full. Now, were you always a Christian? Did you grow up in a Christian home? I did, Laura. I was really blessed. I was blessed with a wonderful godly father and mother. And I came mm -hmm. to faith in Christ at the age of about 12 uh, and then um, one thing led to another, and I later became a full-time missionary. And so that's what I'm doing to this day now. I'm full-time involved in missions around uh, Central and Southern Africa. And you've been doing that for how long? Uh, I went, I started in missions, I'm trying to think now, from the... It's been uh, a while, hasn't it? It's been a long time, goodness yeah. me. I think I went full-time in the year 2000, and before that I was part-time. Goodness okay. me, it's a long time. You're making me feel really old now, Laura. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm noting the dedication is what I'm doing. I'm doing <laughs> oh, that's yeah. great. Thank you. Yeah, because that's got to be a tough job, especially, um, you know, I want to get into later a little bit more, if you're willing, um, about some of the, uh, some of the current events happening today and your take on that. But let's kind of stay on track here for now. 
And um, I'm wondering, uh, I think obviously what the reason most people are tuned in probably are they want to hear this, hear your story. Um, and it doesn't have to be in grave detail, but for those that have never heard um, about your story, could you take us there and, and set that up for us and give us some context about what was going on? And um, because that's the whole purpose of, I think, your book, right? That you that you wrote. You've written more that's than great. one book, but could you refer to that as well so we can get a a good idea of of what this all is about? Great, sure, Laura. So on the twenty fifth of July, nineteen ninety three, we were sitting in a church service in Cape Town, South Africa, when all of a sudden there was a noise at the front door of the church. Uh, I was sitting. Uh, alone that evening, uh, my friends had come late to the church, and so we were dispersed in the congregation of about a thousand people. Uh, could a thousand. usually a thousand people in the church. Yeah, they wow. could usually seat about one and a half thousand, but it was a cold winter's night in July. We're in the southern hemisphere, so it was pretty cold here by us. And um, while I was uh, sitting alone, we heard this noise at the front door of the church. We were listening to some young people that were singing beautifully on the stage, and we just uh, enjoying the, the wonderful hymns that the choruses that they were singing. Uh, there was this noise at the front door of the church, and all of a sudden, terrorists stepped in. They had automatic rifles, and they also had grenades. And they had attached nails to the outside of the grenades to get more shrapnel. Um, they, they lobbed the grenades into the congregation, and then they opened up fire with their automatic rifles. I was sitting fourth row from the back of the church, and the church was built very much like a cinema. So you can just imagine uh, I could literally kneel uh, behind the bench in front of me. Uh, everybody went down onto the ground. We went as low as possible. And I had a 38 Special Revolver, the one I mentioned earlier, a little two-inch barrel, uh, and an ankle holster. So as we went down on the ground, I pulled out the, the revolver, and I knelt uh, with the bench in front of me, um, uh, leaning over the bench, and I took two shots at the attackers. Uh, I must first mention, too, that when I first saw the attack or heard and saw what was going on, I actually thought they were doing a play. And it's only oh. when I saw the splinters being shot out of the benches in the church that I realized this is not a play. This is, this is something real that's happening. So wow. I took two shots. I took two shots. So fourth row from the back of the church. There are a thousand people in the church. It's a large auditorium. Uh, any of the listeners uh, would understand that a 38 special two-inch barrel is not made for shooting across a thousand people inside a, a large uh, auditorium like that. So I got on on my hands and knees and I leopard crawled. I don't know what you call it in America. Get down on all fours and you crawl as low as you can to the ground. Yeah. Uh, to the aisle. And my idea was that I needed to get in behind the attackers at close range and shoot them in the back to stop the carnage. Mm -hmm. And to cut a long story short, I had to kick open the back door of the church. I ran outside. And as I came around the corner, I saw the attackers were ready at the getaway car. And what I didn't know at the time, Laura, was that um, I'd hit one of the attackers inside the church with one of my rounds. And so they had fled because they had been shot at. And mm -hmm. one of them was standing at the back left door of the getaway car. And he had his rifle on his hip. And he wasn't going anywhere. I thought, well, the only thing I can think is that he is waiting for me to come running out the door they had come out of. And he would have just lowered his rifle and blown me away. But by mm -hmm. God's grace, I was behind them. I took my last three shots at them. They jumped in the car and they drove off. So that's just a quick synopsis of what happened. The whole attack was probably a couple of seconds. People were saying it took 30 seconds and one minute. Well, if there was a 30, 30 seconds or one minute of people with automatic rifles inside a church, they wouldn't have only killed 11 people. Uh, many yeah. more would have died. So the 11 murdered and over 50 were injured. Uh, there were some young people that really made a difference in the lives of others there. One was uh, Gerard Harker, 21-year-old. He had a grenade land in the pew next to his uh, 
his seat, his, his uh, bench that he was sitting in, and he fell on top of the grenade and took a full body blow to himself to protect those sitting around oh him. Yeah, another, another young man, Richard O'Kill, is 17 years old. He had two girls sitting next to him, Lisa and Bonnie. And uh, he, um, Richard and one of the girls uh, went down onto the ground, Lisa, and Bonnie was scared stuff. She sat there and didn't move. She was just uh, like a block of ice. She couldn't move, just sat and stared at what was going on around her. So Richard went onto his haunches, went up into the air to pull her down onto the ground. And as he saved her life doing that, he took a bullet in the back of the head. So you could just imagine these youngsters, obviously they had no idea um, what was coming, you know, but uh, what, what an amazing uh, young man. Uh, a, a Russian sailor, his name was Dmitry Makagon. He had a grenade land in his, that was pretty tragic for him. Uh, the church had a ministry to Russian sailors at the time. They would pick them up at the local harbor in Cape Town. We do a lot of uh, economic moving of things around the world and the, the ships come and uh, park in at uh, Cape Town Harbor. So the ministry fetched people at the harbor, brought them to the church, and they would sit in the uh, the time of worship and singing. They would join us in the main auditorium, and then after that they'd go to another hall where they'd have an interpreted um, sermon for them. And unfortunately they were still with us in the main auditorium when the attack took place. So that, that's a sort of a synopsis of, of what happened that evening. And then, as you mentioned, I wrote a book called Shooting Back, The Right and Duty of Self-Defense. And the idea of that was to warn Christian men looking into the future, that, uh, or at least in the Western world, um, that these things can happen, these atrocities, and we need to be ready to protect the innocent. And we have mm -hmm. not just a... Um, we have a responsibility, we have a duty, it's not just a right. Uh, we have a biblical duty to protect the innocent, those whom God has entrusted to us. Wow, I'm just processing everything that you just said. And what I think is probably the... most... Sorry, <laughs> that's really touching what happened. Um, I'm thinking about those kids. Um, yeah. I think okay. that uh, the part of the story that got me the most um, as I was doing research on you was, of course, what happened in, in your heroic actions and the actions of others in, in the church that day. But the fact that you eventually went to was it one attacker that, or could you, yeah, tell me what the story is on that? You sure. went to them and forgave them. And I need a timeline here because I mean, oh, I can't give this, you that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't this, check it, but Laura, it was, it was a long time. It, did, it, it wasn't overnight. Been. It had to have yeah. been, it was a long time. Yes, you, you're right. So I couldn't, um, I really struggled with the, the issue of uh, unforgiveness. That was a big deal. I uh, I wasn't forgiving. In fact, straight after the attack, the South African police called meetings at the church uh, for a time of counseling in dealing with terrorism, processing this, people with PTSD that were suffering, sleepless nights, cold sweats, uh, being scared everywhere you go, every time you know, you hear a, a door bang, you you die for cover under the, the uh, mm -hmm. coffee table, that sort of thing. And so I went to these meetings. In fact, my aunt phoned me, uh, my aunt that helped teach me how to walk. And she said, Charles, you better get to this meeting. She knew I'd never go to a meeting with psychologists. But anyway, <laughs> okay. So, okay, Auntie Avril, I'll do whatever you told me to do. I wouldn't want to get on the wrong yeah. side of Auntie Avril, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so off I go to this meeting. And it was just shocking to me, Laura, that everybody at the meeting was saying how they'd forgiven the terrorists. And um, we're talking about a man who lost his wife, you know, kids who lost their mother or parents. And it was just unbelievable. And I was thinking, over my dead body, am I going to forgive these people, you know? Um, and so I really struggled with that for a long time. Uh, I, I even thought up a theology of unforgiveness. You know, I was a 
Christian man. I was uh, very involved in Christian missions at the time. And I came up with a theology to back uh, my reasoning to not have to forgive. Mm. And uh, by God's grace, by reading the scriptures and listening to godly men speaking about forgiveness, I realized that I have a, a responsibility, a duty, and if I don't forgive them, I'm the one that's actually in sin. And, you know, when you're dealing with bitterness, Laura, it's because of other people's sin. You know, if you were the sinner, you were the guy that did the bad thing. If it was you that had shot somebody or stolen something, then you can go to the Lord. You can repent of your sin. You can turn from it. You can say you're sorry. You can promise you're never going to do it again. God will forgive you, and you can get on with your life. But what do you do with somebody else's sin? You know, it wasn't it wasn't me that shot people. It was them. <laughs> and, uh, and so I really struggled with this idea of this, this bitterness and this hatred towards these people. But it wasn't my sin. It was their sin. How do I deal with other people's sin? Yeah. That's you know caused havoc in my life, and I think mm -hmm. all of us need to deal with that in some way or another. All of us have been hurt, you know, by a father or an uncle, or an auntie or brother or sister, and we've been offended. And we all of us have been through difficult times. So the question is, how, how do we deal with these things? And at the end of the day, uh, we have to forgive because God commands forgiveness, and when God commands it, He's his law is perfect, and if he commands it, there's a reason for it, and that's for us to live a fulfilled life, to us, for us mm -hmm. to, to benefit from it. Um, and then, you know, some people would argue, uh, but, um, you know, these people, and I also argue this, you know, these guys, the attackers didn't repent to their sin, they didn't ask for forgiveness, they didn't uh, forgive my forefathers, and, you know, God says, if you don't forgive others, I won't forgive you. And so there was this big challenge and turmoil in my life. But at the end of the day, you know, if, if we don't forgive others, God says he's not going to forgive us. And do we want to live in bitterness and hatred all our lives? Or do we want to live with um, his forgiveness and us forgiving others um, and rather enjoy um, his joy uh, mm -hmm. rather than, and the, than a life of hatred? And some people would argue that, the attackers needed to ask for forgiveness for us to forgive them. Well, my question then to them was, well, one of the attackers got killed in a motor car accident after the, after the attack. It was completely unrelated. Uh, he was dead, so he couldn't ask for forgiveness. He couldn't repent. He couldn't turn around and say, I'm sorry for what I've done. So what now? Does that mean that now for the rest of my life, I must, I can be bitten, have bitterness and hatred in my heart because this guy's died and he can't repent of his sin? So it's a bit mm -hmm. of a fallacious argument, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was long. It, it was quite a while. Um, I had to appear in the KPI court against the attackers. So the one chap that I hit, Kaya Makoma, his blood got onto the seats of the, the getaway car after one of my rounds hit him inside the church. And so through forensics, the police um, arrested him. And I appeared in the Cape High Court to testify against Kaya. Later, they found uh, two of the others uh, also of the attackers. One was killed in the motor car accident. And to cut a long story short, uh, this whole idea of forgiveness that I'd been through, that I'd worked through uh, meticulously, uh, uh, the Lord really laid it on my heart to go and take the gospel of the kingdom of God to Kaya in prison. And wow. so so that, that was quite a traumatic experience uh, for me. I, yeah. I, phoned, I phoned the prison authorities and I said, um, you know, I'd like to come see Kaya Makoma. Uh, you know, how do I go about this? And they asked me, well, who are you? So I said, well, I'm Charles van Weyck. I'm the man that shot Kaya at the St. James Church at the massacre in uh, 1993. And they said, well, in that case, you can't come. <laughs> you, you're going to have to. You're going to have to first contact his uh, his commanders or his leaders and get permission from them, and then then we'll let you in. So I got onto the phone to their political office. So he was in an organization called the Azanian People's Liberation Army, APLA. And they had a political wing uh, called the Pan-Africanist Congress. So I phoned, I don't want to complicate people with all these different names, but I phoned their parliamentary office 
And I told them who I was and that I wanted to meet with them and get permission to see Kaya in prison. And they said, uh, we'd love to have you pop in by us first. We want to meet you, want to see you, and then we'll talk about these things. So that's mm. how it happened. I popped in. I met his commander, Letlapa Mbukhlele, and we uh, had a talk together, which was filmed. Uh, we got quite a bit of press regarding this issue. And uh, he literally came with me to the prison and introduced me to Kaya, where we, we sat and spoke together. And then after the introduction, I went there many times after that to, to visit Kaya in prison. Wow. Okay, I want to backtrack just a second. What do you believe or how do you define forgiveness? Forgiveness um, in terms of scripture means to let go. So it means you're not going to take revenge anymore. It doesn't mean that you that you forget um, necessarily. It doesn't mean that what the people did wasn't horrific or terrible or offensive or anything like that. The yeah. bottom line is that you're not going to take revenge. You're not going to take the law into your own hands, and you're not going to um, you're going you're going to let go. That, that's that's the big deal. And that's what makes it so difficult, again, because it's other people's sin you're dealing with. It's not yours. Mm -hmm. And so to put that aside and say, well, um, the Bible says that God, well, God says to us, I will avenge. And so he has put a justice system in place. Um, in fact, the only thing that godly government should be doing is running a justice system. The Bible says in Romans 13 that they need to protect the innocent and punish the guilty. Well, in South Africa, our government does everything except that. Uh, they're involved in everything under the sun except running a decent justice system. Uh, and the other challenge we had is that um, all the attackers were let off free under a commission set up in South Africa called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And the idea there was that if you were involved in any kind of political attacks or um, violence. If you came to the committee and you put your case forward and explained everything that you were involved in, they would consider uh, letting you off or um, doing away with any charges that you might uh, have to go to prison and, and that sort of thing. So all three um, of the attackers were let off through that TRC. Uh, Kaya, the, the chapter I actually shot, got involved in bank heists after that. So he was caught again with uh, attacking bank vehicles to steal cash. So he's back in prison again for a very long time. He's been there wow. basically almost since 1993 since he was caught, but for a different issue uh, this time what around. What was his reaction to you coming to him? I mean, how did that all happen? Yeah, it was really interesting. We we sat chatting and I said to him, you know, I'm, I'm coming to tell you about uh, the gospel of salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I explained to him what that is, that Jesus Christ has died on the cross for our sin, um, that he has uh, taken our sin away through his death because blood had to be shed for the remission of sins. And that uh, we, through our repentance and putting our faith in Jesus Christ, uh, we can enjoy communion with God. And the Bible says that we saved by God's grace through faith. And Kaya said to me, no, but I'm going to heaven because I've been fighting for a just political cause. Wow. And uh, that, that was part of what we call black theology. Um, it originated, I think, in South America and then came over to Africa. So revolutionary theology. The idea was that if Jesus Christ was around today, he would have had an AK-47 and would have been fighting for a just political system. And so uh, I explained to him, but uh, Kaya, the scripture is very clear, and it tells us that we say by God's grace through faith. The, the grace comes from God. The faith is a gift from God. There's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. And I said to him, Many people think that they can um, get saved or that they can make good with God through good works. I said, what you did was bad works. It was evil. It was wicked. You murdered innocent people. I said, there's no way you're going to heaven. Um, you know, Even if we can't get in with good works, you're certainly not going to be getting in with bad works. And so I explained to him uh, the, the way of salvation as laid out in Scripture. And he was very open to it. We, we sat and chatted many times. 
you spoke about all the kinds of things you're not supposed to speak about in decent company, you know, philosophy, uh, um, politics, religion, <laughs> all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, on, Laura, the interesting thing about these young men is that they were teenagers when they attacked our church. Now, that, that's very normal. Uh, that communists use teenagers. We call them in Africa. They get used as cannon fodder, you know, young children. Mm -hmm. Um, Nelson Mandela's group, the African National Congress, if they had big demonstrations and things, they'd put little children in the front knowing that the police wouldn't want to shoot them uh, if they were burning down places and petrol bombing vehicles and that sort of thing. So they were young, but they were so politically astute. They could give me full rundown, uh, at least Kaya could, on why he was involved in the revolution, what he was fighting for, why he was doing it, you know, uh, why he was willing to give his life for it. And all these things, and, and I'm thinking, well, these young communists are at the top of their game. they kids, they're willing to die for their, their cause. And what are we doing with our youngsters in our churches? We, we're playing games and going on camps to find out who can date each other and do silly little, silly little things together. Well, we've lost the plot. These young men would out-debate and out-maneuver every single Christian kid that I knew <laughs> at that age, mm -hmm. um, you know. They are at the top of their game. And, you know, most of our Christian kids don't even know what a biblical worldview is. We don't know um, what God expects of politicians in Africa. They think they are law unto themselves. They can make up any laws that they want. And we, we just have to obey all their evil and wicked rules and the way they're stealing everything uh, from the country and leaving people destitute. I'm, I mean, I don't, I don't want to go on and on about it, but... Uh, yeah. Let's just say, let's just say that our South African government is not God's servant to do us good. They're an evil, wicked power that needs to be resisted. Oh, you're so right. I'm just thinking about you. I'm putting myself in your shoes going into that prison. I assume it's a prison. What kind of a feeling did you have going up to one of the people? that did such evil things um by that time you'd made up your mind and your heart was right and you knew you were doing the right thing i know but there's still was there still some reservation or i don't know what the word would be anxiety perhaps about like how is this going to happen and not that you it's like you, it, here's what the way i want to like because i've had situations in my life where i knew i was doing the right thing i knew it was what god called me to do but that doesn't make it easy right oh, and i'm right. just curious what that moment was like for you did you have some trepidation about that or any doubt or hesitancy or or how would it be received or i mean there's so many unknowns going into that kind of a situation and that's not something that most people a get the opportunity to do or b would have the courage to do uh, it, yeah that's a, a great question um uh, laura i've got friends that i wanted to take with who had been at the st james massacre and i said to them come you want to come with me and meet one of the attackers and they just said to me no there's no way in this world that I want to meet one of them. I I still haven't got over it and whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and and I, I was like that in the beginning too. I wasn't um, this wonderful, forgiving young man either uh, at the time that this took place and, and for quite a while afterwards. But th there was there were some funny things that happened. For instance, um, I was with the commander, Letlaup and Bechlele, and when we went into the prison and we arrived there, now it's very official, you know, um, everybody knew who Kaya was, uh, people who knew who I would be coming there with, with his commander and that sort of thing. And so I said to Letlapa, the commander, I said, just hang on quickly, please. I need to go into the main office and go hand him my firearm. <laughs> and um. he was like, what? You've been carrying a <laughs> firearm the whole time we've been together? <laughs> so, um. so that was like lighthearted and a bit funny, you know. Yeah. Uh, so off I went and I had to hand him my firearm and, and get paperwork done and that so I could go into the to go meet Kaya. And then um, the a little up introduced us and we sat on benches. It's it's not a very nice place. I drove past a prison the other day in America and it looked like a corporate headquarters, such a beautiful <laughs> building. I was like, goodness me, is this was a prison looks like yeah. I was a little I was a little bit different in Africa. Yeah. And um so he introduced us, and 
Kaya and I started chatting and Letlapa was in on the conversation and Kaya said something and, you know, speaking about his salvation and his work through the, uh, that he's going to earn his salvation and me correcting him, the story I've told you. And so we, we were working through that and Letlapa thought this was hilarious, you know, and you're saying to Kaya, ah, oh, man, you don't know, you've been caught out. This chap's now telling you, you know, the real story and you thought wrong. And so there, there's this banter between them. Wow. And so it was, it was, a, it was, it was it's kind fun. of lighthearted then. It was it was lighthearted in the beginning, you know, with these yeah. things of me handing him my gun and then us bantering around in the beginning. But I can tell you, I was very emotional about it. Um, actually, afterwards, uh, not before. Mm -hmm. um, I think I realized that um, we're dealing with human beings who also struggle. You know, like one of the comments he made to me was. Um, I, I, I called him out on something after a discussion that we were chatting about, and, and he said to me, you've got to understand, I also need to sleep at night. Hmm. He's a human being. He's, he's done terrible things. How do you live with that? He's not a Christian. He doesn't know what salvation is. He doesn't understand true forgiveness through God. Um how do you how do you live with that for the rest of your life? And and they they would say that you know that the idea was that we're really sorry for what we've done. We found it necessary, but taking life is a big deal, and making those decisions is a big deal. Um, and and but we've done that now. You know how do you live with that for the rest of your life? That they're also human. Um, very, very difficult circumstances. I, I afterwards was more um, concerned emotionally for their salvation and for them to know Christ and for them to know his uh, true forgiveness that we can experience. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so then I went back many times after that uh, and we, we grew closer over time. Uh, and then he was moved away. He was moved out of, out of our area altogether probably about 600 miles away, and so I didn't see him again after that. Uh, the other yeah. issue also the other issue also was that um, I think it was Stalin who brought about the idea of robbing banks to financially support the revolution. And so this is what the, uh, the terrorists in South Africa would do, and particularly their organization. Uh, but after the revolution was over, Kaya carried on with this robbery of bank vehicles and his own friends and his, his cadres uh, rejected him completely because of that. So um, wow. they believed that as long as you are using the funds to help the revolution and to pay for and supply funds for the revolution, that was ethically um, permissible. But doing it for your own pocket that to them was unforgivable. You don't steal for mm. your own pocket. And so they rejected him wow. completely. So as far as I know, he's he's not a he's not a big name brand among the the cadres the cadres anymore. Wow. So I can't help but hear everything that happened back in '93. 30 and, years ago. Yeah. But I can't help but hear this. And this idea of uh, forgiveness and, and what the Bible says and terrorism and how can people be so evil and do these things and not think about what's happening in Israel right now. And sure. I think about the atrocities happening over there and, and everything that you just said about forgiveness. And yet everyone is calling for revenge, essentially. Um mm. How do we reconcile that? What is your opinion about what's going on in Israel right now? Um, I'm not fully clued up on it. Uh, I do know that the South African government has taken the side of the um, the, the Muslim cause, uh, Gaza, the people in Gaza, um, and many people in South Africa are arguing, you know, don't hold it against people. When they're pushed into a corner, they're doing what we did in South Africa uh, and that mm. sort of thing. I believe that terrorism is uh, completely and utterly outside of our Christian scope or means of doing things. I believe that it's uh, wicked and sinful. It's quite interesting because um, I was just asked the other day on, on radio here in South Africa, uh, the, 
person that was interviewing with uh, interviewing me was concerned and a bit upset that I was referring to the attackers as terrorists. Like, how dare you? So I said, it was really interesting because this came up in a in a meeting with Letlap and I, where we were in a press conference together, a press uh, interview, and the very topic of terrorism was brought up. And Letlapa, the uh, the commander of the attackers, said, "Well, the St James Church massacre was a terrorist attack in the true sense of what terrorism is all about." We did it to instill fear in the whites in South Africa. And so the issue was that during the apartheid era, everybody had actually come. They were sitting around the negotiation tables. They were busy working out a new constitution for our country. And then the attack took place. And they were saying, but why then? Everybody was sitting around the table. Apartheid had been done away with. The laws were on their way out. At least they weren't being applied anymore. And then you shot up the church. And he said, no, it was to instill fear in the whites. And so the idea of terrorism is to instill fear in a group of people. And what they do is they'll just say to their leaders, just give the people, the communists, whatever they want. Don't question anything. We want to, we don't want the terrorism carrying on anymore. Just, you know, keep quiet and do what you're told. And so you lose all your freedom uh, through that. So the violence, we've got to understand that violence um, is the immoral use of force. And terrorism is an immoral use of force. And our morality as Christians comes from Scripture. So we can take life only when Scripture tells us that we can take life, mm -hmm. uh, when God, when God uh, allows that to happen. So we can't indiscriminately kill people. So our, the Scriptures are very careful and very uh, deliberate in the way they lay out when life can be taken. So um, violence is the immoral use of force, um, like the attackers attacking our church, and defensive gun use, which I was um, doing inside the church, that is the moral use of force. We have a biblical, theological standard by which we measure this. So um, that that sort of gives you an idea of where I stand on the, the Israeli issues. So um, mm -hmm. the murder, and, and it gets complicated because, you know, it can start off with terrorism or violence and things, and then you start getting the two governments fighting each other, and that's when that mm -hmm. then becomes a legitimate war, you know. And that's a right. different story again to mm -hmm. people just taking the law into their own hands. And it's always complicated. It's never simple. There's always um, lots of complications that that go with these things. But but what's yeah. going on there now, we've lived through that in South Africa. We, In fact, I can't remember in South Africa when we ever lived at peace in my lifetime, and I've just turned 56. Mm -hmm. So we've always had trauma. Uh, there's mm -hmm. always murders mm -hmm. going on. There's always uh, chaos in the country, political chaos, political trauma. Um, you know, now there are murders in South Africa, and they say it's not political anymore, but we had 28,000 murders last year. We have more wow. people murdered in we have more murdered people murdered in South Africa than um, injuries in the war of Ukraine in a year. Um, that's how bad it is in South Africa. Extremely, extremely dangerous country to live in uh, right now. Wow. I'm learning a lot. Not all things I want to know, but I'm learning <laughs> a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time, and I want to give you an opportunity to speak about your books. You have more than one, and then I noticed there was a guide that you sent me a link to as well. Could you explain what all those books are about and why you wrote them? Sure, sure. So the first one was Shooting Back, The Right and Duty of Self-Defense. That was giving a, a rundown on the theological ideas of Christians being able to protect the innocent and uh, standing your ground and literally saying to uh, Christian men that we have a responsibility before God to protect the innocent. Then, to cut a long story short, I was involved in another shootout. So one what? of the one of the former terrorists actually came to faith in Christ. Uh, his name is Lindile Kile Nishe. He was a unit commander. He told me that he was in the intelligence of the Azanian People's Liberation Army, and he knew all about the St. James Church attack before it took place. And he said, my greatest desire was that there wouldn't be a living soul afterwards. And uh, this young man from being a terrorist uh, enemy, is now a brother in Christ. And I was dropping him off in one of our, we call it a township here. It's a mixture of uh, informal and formal housing. 
And we had some hijackers uh, try and uh, rob us. They took my cell phone and uh, identification documents and things. And they asked me if I was armed. They seemed to know that there was a gun somewhere around. Um, and so it looks like it was an inside job uh, regarding them particularly oh. stopping me. Um, and then I lied to them. I told them I didn't have a gun. Their body searched me. And I kid you not, Laura, they didn't go down to my ankle where I had my firearm in an ankle holster. Oh. Um, so they left me and they started harassing an elderly gentleman in the front of my pickup. And they were body searching him and checking the car, looking all over the car, trying to find a firearm. It's like they knew there had to be one. So wow. I think that they were set up. They knew that I was coming in. They knew that I, they had to come, you know, where I was going to stop. They knew everything. Wow. So uh, while they were searching him, I pulled my, 30, uh, my uh, pistol at that time out of my uh, ankle holster. I shouted at them to get them to... Um, to not concentrate on the elderly man that they were harassing, and I opened up fire. But Lindile Kile, who was hiding on the, the one side of the car, shouted at me, shall get down. And what I didn't realize was that the attackers had a sentry amongst the shacks, the, the tin homes, tin shacks, and somebody, the sentry was shooting at me to give his guys who are running away some cover. It's just incredible. Very, oh, very well wow. executed um, attack. And by God's grace, we came out alive of that too. Uh, but there again, so my second book is called Reloaded, <laughs> Reloaded, Shooting Back Again. <laughs> so that's the second book. Oh, and wow. then, when, when did that um, happen? Uh, oh, my goodness. You and your dates and your timelines. <laughs> well, I'm just curious. <laughs> I think it was 10 years afterwards. It's probably 19... Oh. 93 so yeah about 10 years later or so somewhere around there um, i do it's all it's all documented i just can't remember dates um <laughs> and so I, i've got a wonderful wife she remembers exactly everything and on the 15th of december 1985 <laughs> we did this and i'm like oh my goodness um so, so a decade later you're in another shootout that's incredible yeah. well it's just it's the it's really it is really incredible because both times I shouldn't have come out alive, and it's really only God's grace. I'm not a great shot, and so my <laughs> my third my third book my third book a guide is actually called How to Win a Gunfight, even if you're not a great shot. So so that's a free guide. It's not just only <laughs> dealing with shooting, but it's actually yeah. it's a free guide. I'm giving Christian men and saying, hey. You know, these are some ideas that I've learned and that I've come across in my time in dealing with dangerous situations. I, I minister up in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which isn't democratic or republic. But I've had to deal with uh, soldiers um, who are high, ch child soldiers who are on, high on drugs, mm -hmm. screaming and shouting at us with AK-47s in their hands and their finger on the trigger. So your, your prayer life just like goes into super mode. Uh, very quickly under those circumstances. And so one's got to, you learn as you go along, you know, what, what you need to do, how you need to act in these circumstances. And so that guide is hopefully going to be helpful to men of being aware of the circumstances, you know, being ready and just mm -hmm. what kinds of ideas you should be looking out for, what you should be concerned about. Uh, after 56 years of living in a country where we permanently, uh, having uh, hostilities being worked out uh, in our in our suburbs and in our cities so mm -hmm. so those are the three books and wow. um and uh, the other the other challenge just quickly to to mention is in dealing with uh, running ministry projects in zimbabwe working up in the congo and places like that is that both those countries are gun free zones and because they're gun-free zones. We know that gun-free zones are not gun-free. It just depends mm -hmm. on who is who has the guns. Mm -hmm. And so you'll find that the army, um, the police, and then the rebel soldiers would be the only people that are um, allowed guns or have taken the law into their own hands and just don't care what the government says. And so in the American context, it'll be the thugs out there who don't care about the law. Mm -hmm. But it always leaves the godly, law-abiding Christian man unarmed. Uh, at the end mm -hmm. of the day. Mm -hmm. And so in the Congo, my colleagues were telling me about, or my Christian pastor friends, they were telling me about a colleague of theirs, and it more, happened more than once, who had rebel soldiers come into his church in Congo and accused them 
of making the war go sour for the rebels because of their prayers. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never been accused that my, of my prayers being so effective that it's changed the, the way a war was going uh, in a particular country. But the rebels told the pastor and the congregation that if you carry on praying, we're going to bury your pastor alive. And they didn't have a committee on a should we pray or not pray committee. They didn't discuss it. It wasn't even a topic of conversation. The church carried on praying. And the rebel soldiers came in and they buried that pastor alive, Pastor Mongombe, and oh. he left uh, three children and a wife behind. And I said to my friend, the pastor, a bishop now in Congo, I said, but where were the Christian men? Why weren't they armed? Why didn't they stand up, the deacons, and say to the rebel soldiers, go ahead, make our day? Mm -hmm. And he said, no, we've, we've all been disarmed. We don't have any guns. And so um, he said, uh, and I said, but the, the deacons should have been armed. They should have been there to help. And he said, it's so interesting that you say that. He said, there's a, a mineral, a mining area very close by. And he said, the people, they are all armed. They would not cooperate with the army when they went house to house and searched and, and uh, took people's firearms away from them. They just wouldn't cooperate. And uh, he said, do you know what? There's never any crime in that mining area. It is the most <laughs> peaceful area in the country. And yeah. so the penny, the penny dropped, you know, for him. And yeah. in Zimbabwe, we've seen the same thing. The, the, the thug Robert Mugabe murdered over 20,000 people of uh, political um, people that were on the opposite side of the spectrum to him. And there again, people were disarmed. They couldn't defend themselves. But when you can't defend yourself, uh, Laura, the next thing that goes is your freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. So you can't find somebody in Zimbabwe who wants to speak politics with you or tell you all the terrible things the government's doing to them mm -hmm. because they are so scared of, of saying anything. They don't have freedom of speech. They can't defend themselves against a bunch of thugs in government. And that's our challenge in Africa. We've got thugs on the street and we have thugs in government. And so we need to be armed to protect ourselves against these people. And um, people in Zimbabwe would whisper to you. They first look around to see that nobody's watching, nobody's wow. close enough to hear what's going on, and they whisper to you about what's really going on in politics over there. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that the way we want to live as a free people? Well, certainly not. There's so much fear. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, I could go on and on and on um, because <laughs> – but I have a time limit, so I'm not going to. <laughs> but but you unpacked a lot in that hour. I, I really appreciate that. Um, I want uh, people to know where they can find out more about you. Where can they get that guide? And we're going to put the links in the description so people can, can get those. Fantastic. It's missionaryinafrica.com. So www.missionaryinafrica.com. Um, you can go there. And if you join my email list for my newsletter. you got to give me something for the free guide. It's not free. you got to give me your email. Um, and if you get onto my newsletter, um, you, you can download the, the free guide. And I hope it's a blessing to, to those who download and read it. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. I, I, um, I can definitely say you've been through quite a bit. And, and to see you sitting there today, you just seem so at peace and calm, even though our world around us in many ways is in turmoil right now. And so I wonder, do you have any parting thoughts for the audience before we wrap up? I, I do. I, uh, Being a, a full-time Christian missionary, I believe that the gospel of the kingdom of God is the answer to our challenges. Um, that's exactly why I'm willing to go into war zones in Africa, in Central Africa, and preach that gospel and teach people a biblical worldview. Uh, basically, the idea that Jesus Christ and his word must be applied to every area of life. I've seen people's family changed. Um, I've seen people's personal lives changed. I've seen families changed. I've seen churches changed. Governments changed in Africa when they have put God's word first and applied his law, even in the social political arena. That's where we mm -hmm. see true freedom. God says that he's come to set us free. He hasn't given us a yoke. And so by God's grace, we'll carry on doing that, taking that gospel of salvation and of God uh, of God over to the nations. And we'll keep carrying on with that work and pray for his freedom to transcend every area of our lives. So well said. We need that hope right now, for sure. We do.
Thanks, Laura. Great chatting to you. And thank you very much for a wonderful interview. Yes, thank you. Okay, guys, tell me in the comments, what did you think of my interview with Charles? That was an incredible interview. And I was so fortunate to be able to interview him this week. Um, wow, it's a lot to unpack. Um, tell me in the comments what you think. And then don't forget, if you enjoyed this, to like, share, subscribe, and do all those things, please, to help the channel and share this with people that you think uh, might benefit from this. We'd really appreciate that. Um, one more quick thing I want to say, and then if Adam has anything, uh, any commentary, I'll let him come on. I just want to thank all of you guys who have helped support Depend Defenders Live on the Locals community. That really helps me out. Um, there is a lot of work behind the scenes going on, and um, that channel is the, the place you can go for exclusive content, content that you won't see on Facebook or YouTube. We have a Defenders Uncensored series there for paid members. And it's, uh, I think it's only $7 a month for that. So um, the last episode that just dropped is called What Makes a Strong Man. And that was a great interview that we did. It was more of a roundtable discussion. And so I uh, invite you to go check that out if you think you might be interested. Defenders Uncensored is a lot of honest conversations and topics that sometimes are called controversial, but we don't think they should be and um, things that you won't see on YouTube or Facebook. Um, Adam, did you have anything you wanted to add tonight? You know, I don't honestly think there was a lot to add to that. No, clearly a man of God and a yeah. man who loves those that he was there to minister and to protect. And what a, what a brilliant view of both uh, the Bible God's love and forgiveness. And I think that's one of the hardest things that we all struggle with is forgiveness. And, and just, just something that we could take away from him was that one tiny thing alone. Yet there was a million other things to me. There's not a lot to add to this. I think that was a brilliant interview and I'm so glad you had him on. Yeah, me too. Awesome. Well, um, that wraps up the hour for tonight. I'll see you beautiful people again next Wednesday evening, 7 p.m. Mountain time. Until then, take care.